Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeff Jones. I'm the Director of Education and Training for Blaze Sports America. On behalf of U.S. Paralympics and Blaze Sports America, I want to welcome you to the series, uh, webinar series. Today's topic, Biomechanics of Sports Injuries in Athletes with Physical Disabilities. Go ahead, Ben. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ben Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a professor of sports science in the Department of Health, Physical Education, and Sports Science for Kennesaw State University. He's also the director of the Global Center for Social Change and the associate dean of the College of Health and Human Services. Again, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Johnson as today's speaker. Well, thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you for everyone who's in attendance, wherever you might be. Um, our challenge today is to cover a significant amount of information in a relatively short amount of time. Um, hopefully, at the end of this participant or at the end of this uh, webinar, you'll be uh, able to learn and explain basic concepts of sport biomechanics as they relate to sport performance and injury. Uh, you'll learn about relationships between stress and strain and how those impact the musculoskeletal tissues of the body, and also to understand some of the basic anatomical considerations of the musculoskeletal system. And then lastly, to identify specific aspects of disability sport and physical activities that may contribute to injury. So basically today we're going to be covering some, uh, some common uh, physics issues that are applied to the anatomy of the human body and look at how particularly exercise physical activity and sport impact on those. Biomechanics is a core subject in the area of exercise science, uh, sports science, and physical education, uh, but impacts broadly across, across a number of other areas. And so far as we're concerned, it's particularly relative to uh, physical education teachers, uh, therapists, uh, physicians of an orthopedic nature, sport coaches, personal trainers, exercise instructors, and obviously athletes. In order to understand the particular issues that uh, of a biomechanical nature that lead to injury, it's incumbent that we recognize that force is the primary catalyst for injury. And hopefully this graphic expresses sort of the continuum that occurs that might lead to uh, injury of the athlete. First of all, force is created uh, from within and from outside the body. The forces created lead to motion. Motion, of course, leads to energy, and more particularly kinetic energy. And the injury that is the energy that is generated through motion can very oftentimes cause tissues of the body to deform as that force or energy is applied to the body, thus uh, increasing the chance for injury or increasing injury potential. But there's a direct D line, as you can see on the graphic here, between the production of force and the potential for injury. So clearly it's our uh, challenge to understand how we can optimize the forces that are applied to the body and to uh, understand how we can control those forces both from the standpoint of improving performance but also doing so while reducing the potential for injury. So as I said previously, the uh, the motion of the body is a critical factor, and so we have to talk a little bit about velocity, and there are two kinds of velocity. One is linear velocity, which is velocity that occurs basically in straight lines, and there's rotational velocity, velocity where, say, the shoulder or the leg is rotating about the shoulder or the, the hip joint. Uh, velocity is defined as a change in position of an object over a period of time. And so when you divide the amount of displacement that occurs or the distance moved by the amount of time that took place between where it was and where it is, then you can calculate how fast it was moving. And obviously when athletes move at higher speeds or higher velocities, the chances for injury are increased. Rotational velocity, on the other hand, is rotation as I said, of a segment like the arm or the leg. Rotational velocity is the amount of rotational displacement that occurs. In other words, the position uh, between, uh, uh, or a change in position between where a segment might start its motion and where a segment might end its motion. And then, of course, how much time it took to move in between those two positions. And we call that angular velocity or omega. But there is obviously a relationship between those two. So as we can see in this uh, bow ball player, uh, 
in order to roll the ball from one end of the court to the other, the goal is to create as much a linear velocity of the ball as possible and do so in such a way that the opponent can't get his or her body to the ball. And so the velocity of the ball is created by the length of the radius of the arm segment and how fast that arm is rotating. And so we know that the faster one rotates their arm, the greater muscular force that has to be created and to, to accelerate the ball to that high velocity. And so, of course, if there's a high velocity, there must have been a high acceleration. And once we have the arm moving, then, of course, we have to stop the arm. So in considering the broad spectrum of disability sport, there are a number of activities where the goal is to generate high linear or high rotational velocities of the body segment. So we have two potential areas for injury when the arm or leg or body is accelerating up to the velocity desired and then trying to rapidly stop those motions. And then, of course, we've got the categories of collisions and things of that nature. But obviously, high-speed collisions or high-velocity collisions are also likely to lead to injury. Another important consideration that we have to, to make before we can really talk about injury are Newton's laws of motion. And as you know from your middle school physics classes or science classes, there are three laws of motion. The first law is the law of inertia, and that states that a body will remain at rest or will maintain a constant velocity unless acted upon by an external force that changes that state of motion. So in other words, objects, including human bodies, like to continue doing what they're doing at the moment, and they will resist any change uh, that is offered to that state of motion. So in order for the judo player to make a throw, he's first having to overcome the inertia offered by the, the mass of his opponent's body. So inertia is directly related to mass, which is directly related to weight. So the more mass or weight, the more inertia an object offers. The second law that we have to understand is the law of acceleration. In order for these wheelchair athletes to uh, sprint away from the starting line, it's necessary that they create force which is applied to the mass of their body and chair, which causes an acceleration. And it's that continued application of force with every stroke of the arms on the wheels that will cause the wheelchair uh, velocity to increase. So Newton's second law is the law of acceleration and states that a force applied to a body causes an acceleration of that body of a magnitude proportional to the force and the direction of the force and inversely proportional to the body's mass. So it's important for the athlete to be strong so that he or she might be able to create a large force, but it's also important that they not be carrying excessive body mass that uh, uh, doesn't otherwise provide any sort of productive uh, uh, force to the, the issue at hand. So clearly the, the better athlete would be the athlete that is strong, has a very lean body mass, and is able to use that strength to cause acceleration of the chair. On the other side of the coin, then, of course, we have to understand that once we have that body moving, we have to stop it. So that acceleration value could just as well be thought of as deceleration. And so we have to also consider both the positive uh, increase in velocity and the negative increase in velocity that occurs in various sport performance activities. And then lastly is the third law of motion, the law of action and reaction. For every force created on an object, there's an equal but opposite force created. So that when one body exerts a force on the second body, the second body exerts a reaction that's equal in magnitude and opposite in direction of the first body. So when an athlete pushes against the wheels of the wheelchair, the wheelchair wheel pushes back against them. When an athlete pushes against the track, the track pushes against them. When two bodies collide in wheelchair rugby, both bodies feel exactly the same amount of force but in opposite directions. Another critical factor for consideration as we move towards the discussion of injury is that of frictional force. Frictional force is equal to mu times r, where mu is the coefficient of friction and r is considered the normal reaction force. The mu value is really just a measure of the, the, relative, <coughs> excuse me, the relative roughness between surfaces. So the spikes of a track shoe which are able to bite into the synthetic surface of the track makes the coefficient of friction quite high. If, on the other hand, the sprinter might be running in a pair of otherwise distance running shoes where there are no spikes, uh, the, the mu value would be less. Uh, you might also think about walking on an icy surface or walking on a basketball court where there might be some water spilled on the court.
the, the uh, presence of that water between your shoe and the floor will reduce the coefficient of friction and therefore making slippage uh, uh, sig significantly easier. The normal reaction force is a direct, uh, uh, has direct relationship to the weight. And it's not weight directly, but let's, for the sake of the argument, just say that it's the amount of, of weight or force uh, from the person's weight that comes into play. So someone that has a lot of friction would have a lot of roughness between whatever is in contact with the surface with which they're interacting and perhaps a, a large amount of force uh, attributed to their body weight. Frictional forces are important in that they allow athletes to perform, but they can also lead to injury. So blisters and things of that nature come about as a result of friction. But without friction, we wouldn't be able to run, we wouldn't be able to propel a wheelchair, for example. Another factor related uh, indirectly to force is that of linear momentum. And linear momentum is a product of mass and velocity. Again, mass is directly related to weight, so the bigger one's weight, the bigger the mass that they have. And then, of course, velocity is how fast they run. And we know that in collision situations, typically speaking, it is the object with the greatest momentum that wins the collision. It's the, uh, it's the bat in a baseball swing where a home run is hit. The bat, which is, a, which is attached to the player, has greater momentum than does the, 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 the momentum of the ball. And therefore, when bat and ball make contact, the ball flies away from the bat rather than vice versa. So in collision situations, typically speaking, the larger individual moving at a higher velocity will win the collision compared to a smaller individual uh, perhaps moving at even the same velocity. Uh, but keeping in mind that the force of that impact is the same on each particular individual by Newton's third law. Well, very often times we find it necessary in sport participation to change the momentum, either to speed up or to slow down or to increase or to decrease the momentum. So if momentum changes for an athlete, it is typically because their velocity changes and not their mass. In other words, once you're in the heat of battle, uh, if your momentum changes, it's because your velocity has changed. Your mass isn't going to change in the course of that event. Obviously, given many weeks to train so that you can increase or decrease your, your, your mass or weight, then perhaps that value could change. But by and large, what we're trying to control is velocity. So therefore, to increase velocity or, uh, or momentum, one must create force over a period of time, which then, of course, leads to acceleration. And that, again, is Newton's second law. So. The more force created and or the longer the time the force is applied, the more acceleration that will occur. We don't always have control over the forces applied to the body, and we don't have control over the amount of time that the force is applied for. But to the degree that we can, we certainly try to do so. So what I just stated is, is, is shown here uh, on this slide. We call what I just described impulse. Impulse is the way by which momentum is changed. So impulse is change in momentum, but it's also equal to force times time. This is a particularly important uh, variable or concept in understanding why injuries occur. Injuries occur, as I stated earlier, because of, typically speaking, large forces. Um, but it ultimately depends upon the amount of time over which that force is applied to the body. If you look at the graph below, you'll see that force is on the vertical axis and time is on the horizontal axis. And you see a red curve and you see a black curve. And let's, let's imagine that the area underneath those curves is the same. If this is an activity where performing the event quickly is important, we would have to give the advantage to the athlete who portrays the curve displayed in black because he or she would have created a larger amount of force and would have done so more quickly than would the athlete portrayed in red. So imagine this is uh, uh, two uh, amputee sprinters. Uh, the winner of the race would be the individual depicted in uh, the black curve and the second place finisher or the loser would be that in red. So every time the foot touches the ground, the better sprinter, the more powerful sprinter is able to generate his or her forces more rapidly and therefore is able to run faster than his opponent. Well, this comes into play from an injury perspective as well. 
we need to be able, as, as much as we possibly can, to control the magnitude of force and control the time. We might do that through equipment. We might do that through the surface on which the activity is engaged in. We might do that through better technique. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Another factor that comes into play insofar as injury is concerned is that of stability and balance. Stability is affected by factors such as mass, friction, center of gravity, location, and base of support. The more mass an object has, the more stability it has. In other words, the better friction it would have. Where the center of gravity of the object is positioned relative to the base of the sport uh, is a critical factor as well. If the center of gravity line falls close to the edges of the base of the support, uh, then there's an enhanced possibility that the object will lose its balance or lose its stability and will tip over. Balance, therefore, is affected by things like foot position, which affects standing balance. If you widen your stance uh, left and right, forward and backward, then you would, of course, increase your stability and balance in those particular directions. And if you think about it from the perspective of a wheelchair, the wheelchair, uh, uh, the, the width and depth of the wheels on the wheelchair, side to side and front to back, would also come into play. And so down here at the bottom of the screen, you can see that with a wider base of support, with the center of gravity acting in the middle, that's a very stable environment. But when you turn that triangle on its head, such that the apex is at the bottom, with the center of gravity falling directly through the contact point with the surface, it's very easy for it to rotate to the left or to the right uh, because the center of gravity can very quickly move outside the base of support. And here are a couple of examples of that in the disability sports setting. The sprinter on the left and the uh, wheelchair basketball players on the right. So even though wheelchairs are designed to have some degree of stability, it's certainly possible that in the throes of, uh, of performance that one can very quickly lose their balance and tip over. And we certainly have seen it frequently if you've been to wheelchair basketball and wheelchair rugby matches. Well, getting more towards the discussion of injury, um, injuries oftentimes occur because of the resistance that the object offers to motion. Understanding that that resistance is directly related to inertia, the first law of motion. And again, inertia is related to mass or weight. Well, we have two different kinds of resistance to motion. We have mass and we have rotational inertia. Um, mass is, offers resistance to linear acceleration or motion and is directly related to weight. So the more weight we have, the more resistance we have to being moved. Uh, from a rotational perspective, so thinking about rotating the arms, legs, or the whole body, the resistance to rotational acceleration or motion is directly related to the mass of the segment that you're trying to, to move, the distribution of that mass with respect to where the, the, the object might be rotating, and the length of the limb, the segment, or the body. So individuals that are massive, that are tall, and have weight distribution even that's fairly fairly symmetrical from top to bottom, aren't international gymnasts. We don't see any uh, elite gymnasts that are over six feet tall. Not, and part of that is because of their mass, but more particularly it's because of the length of the body. So once a, a body grows to a great length, it's much harder to rotate. So think about that as it relates to the arms or the legs. If you think about someone who's very tall, attempting to sprint, as a general rule, they do not display uh, good running mechanics compared to someone who is shorter in stature. So I like to say to my students, think about the center who's seven feet two running down the basketball court versus the point guard. The point guard looks much more efficient. And that relates back here to this, this notion of rotational inertia. The leg segments of the center offer much more resistance to rotation than do the legs of the shorter guard. And an event like a javelin throw is one where these things come into play. The javelin as an implement is not terribly heavy, but it does offer resistance. And as the javelin thrower goes through his gyrations of throw, he gets into different body positions. And particularly during the acceleration phase of a javelin throw, when the arm is caught behind the body just before it begins to accelerate forward, he's trying to reduce the rotational inertia of his arm of his arm segments particularly so that his trunk can rotate at high velocity so that ultimately he's able to throw the, the, the javelin at a high velocity and at the right angle of release. So athletes are very adept at manipulating uh, the, the rotational inertia uh, factors within the performance. But 
Um, keep in mind that in spite of their good technique, there's still an increased chance for injury the faster they're able to rotate those objects. I mentioned momentum earlier. Well, obviously there are two kinds of momentum, just as there are two types of resistance. There's linear momentum, which is the mass times the velocity, and there's rotational momentum, which is the rotational inertia that I just spoke about, so segmental length and mass distribution and angular velocity. So when you try to rotate uh, the arm segment holding a javelin, holding a disc, holding a, uh, a shot, for example, uh, there is great resistance offered, and the faster the velocity of rotation, the greater the rotational inertia or the greater uh, rotational momentum created. In order to perform at a high level, it's important that, at, that, that an athlete be able to transfer the momentum from different parts of the body. So when you think about someone who's making an overhand throw of a ball, they typically will step, which will then lead to hip rotation, which leads to trunk rotation, which leads to shoulder rotation, to elbow rotation, to wrist rotation, and then release. That transference of energy that occurs from the toes to the fingertips is called the kinetic link principle. And the goal is to transfer the momentum generated from the legs to the lower trunk, to the upper trunk, to the arm segment, and ultimately to the ball, or the tennis racket, or the javelin, or the disc, or whatever the object might be. So when we see someone who throws with a very efficient motion, we say they're well coordinated. So that's what we're talking about here, is the athlete who's able to effectively use his or her body in a controlled, uh, coordinated fashion, transferring momentum from far away to where the release point occurs to ultimately the release point. So that momentum transfer occurs over time. So here's the kinetic link principle with a graph. Um, we have two kinds of kinetic link. We have sequential kinetic link and simultaneous kinetic link. The sequential kinetic link is what I just described. And if we're looking at uh, an athlete who has a spinal cord injury and does not have use of the lower body, then they might be limited by having to start the generation of momentum with their hips only. Uh, but a fully able-bodied individual, we would add in another curve here uh, for the legs, which would ultimately bump all of these different graphs up a little bit higher. And so we know that the able-bodied thrower is able to achieve higher rotational velocities and momentum uh, than uh, are their uh, uh, the disabled counterparts. So as we go higher up the, the trunk in terms of the lesion site and what the athlete has available, then we begin perhaps to even eliminate the hip rotation as a possibility so that it becomes trunk and then arm and then the release point. We use this sequential motion when we're trying to generate high velocity types of activities. So we, we assume that the object that's being interacted with has very low weight, uh, mass or weight, very little inertia. So a sequential throwing motion can be used with a baseball, a softball, a javelin, uh, lighter weight objects such as that. But when we start to talk about the shot in a shot putting action, it's called a put and not a throw. And the reason is that a shot put is more of a pushing action rather than a throwing action when the resistances that the athlete has to work against are of a greater mass, then they adapt what's called a more simultaneous technique so that all the muscles, all the momentum of the body is being generated at the same time. So if we took all these curves here and slid them over underneath each other, all the forces of the body would be coming at one time. Now, realistically speaking, some activities where the resistance isn't terribly, terribly high might incorporate a little bit of both. And in some cases, the shot put falls in, into both categories. But relative to the athlete's strength, perhaps the weaker they are, or let's say the heavier the implement that they're working against, the more simultaneous their motion becomes. So that's true also when you're trying to move the entire body in, uh, in a vertical direction, say, as in a vertical jump. So brings us back to Newton's second law, that F equals ma. And what I've done here in this, in this equation is I've broken out the acceleration into its component parts, changing velocity over time. So what we end up having to do is to consider how these activities, or how these concepts, rather, uh, work off of each other. If I want to make force as big as possible, so I want to make the value bigger, then I can increase the mass, I can increase the velocity, or I can decrease the time. And if I want to make force smaller, then I decrease the mass, decrease the velocity, and increase the time. So in my mind, I have to be able to play those games to understand what might be available to me from a physics concept, but also what realistically can be applied in the activity itself. You may not have time to change the athlete's mass, but if you do, perhaps you can do that. So again, 
you may have much more control over the effort that is put forth, which is force production. Um, you may have some control over the velocity. You may have some control over the time. Likewise, if you're looking at the velocity, uh, where, say, in a javelin throw, you're trying to maximize this velocity. Well, to increase the velocity of the javelin at release, you want to increase the amount of force applied. That force comes from the muscles. You want to apply the force as long as possible. That's from good technique. You really can't affect the mass of the javelin because it's the mass of the javelin that you're throwing. And then, of course, you want to have good preparation, which is how you sort of get yourself up to the line. If you're able to run to the line and increase this value, then it gets added to this. If you're not able to run to the line because you're throwing from a chair, then you don't have the benefit of this. Everything has to come from the forces generated during the actual throw itself. So you can play the game with those variables themselves. <clears throat> Work is another consideration. Work is just a way of looking at how much force is applied and the distance that force is applied for. And then, of course, power is uh, the amount of work that one can perform over a period of time. And so individuals that are powerful are able to do a lot of work quickly. We also can say that, for, that power is a product of force and velocity. The more force the individual can create and the faster they can move, the more powerful they are. Well, now we're starting to look at why injuries occur between power between impulse and between pressure. Pressure is force divided by area. Generally speaking, when an athlete becomes injured, two of the critical factors at play are the amount of force applied to his or her body and the area over which that force was, was, was uh, created. Um, we wear helmets in sports like football and uh, wheelchair rugby, etc., or at least we should. So when a collision occurs such that uh, force is applied directly to the, the skull, the wider the area that force is distributed, the less chance there is for a concussion or any other sort of serious sorts of, uh, of contusion. The helmet is able to spread the force around the head, the skull, so that, there's, so that chance is lessened. So when the area is very small and the force is very high, the chance for a serious injury greatly increases. So let's relate all this now to injury understanding that the way that the athlete accelerates his or her body to create the motion that we've been talking about is an interaction between lots of different tissues. The muscles uh, which attach to the bones by the tendon, the bones themselves which are rigid levers, the ligaments of the body which try to prevent rotations of the bones in undesirable directions, the cartilage which gives some degree of friction reduction and also cushioning uh, within the joint spaces, body fat, which may or may not be a productive tissue depending upon the situation, could be in a collision but not necessarily in performance, and then of course the, the effect that the skin itself would have. Those internal forces are either trying to move the body in an external environment or deal with forces that come from the external environment. So things that we have to consider insofar as understanding injury potential is where is the athlete performing? Uh, obviously, in many cases, they're trying to move the earth, but because the earth is so massive, when they apply force against it, they get thrown or moved rather than the earth being moved. So when you're running, you're actually trying to throw the earth with your foot, but what happens is you get thrown instead. When you're trying to throw a ball, obviously you're able to throw the ball because the mass of the ball isn't equal to that of the earth. So are you, are you performing against the ground? Are you performing on the floor? If so, what kind of floor is it? Does it have any sort of give to it? What kind of traction does it have? Are you on a track? Is it a synthetic track, an asphalt track, or whatever? And then what kind of court might it be? A wooden court, uh, a synthetic court, or whatever? Clearly, if you are engaging in an activity where there are opponents, the ability of your opponent to create force against you, the, the mass or inertia they offer as a factor, and then where and how those opponents interface with your body can come into play. Of course, oftentimes athletes are engaging with implements such as balls, weights, rackets, wheelchairs, etc. The impact of that implement on the body is a consideration. And something that we have to always keep in mind is that gravity is omnipresent. We cannot get rid of gravity. It is, uh, it is our worst enemy sometimes and our best friend sometimes. But keep in mind, gravity is what creates the, 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 the weight that the, the individual is working against and understanding that most of the force that we generate in a sporting environment is against gravity in a vertical direction. Here's an animation of some of the critical aspects of the anatomy that might come into play. Taking a look at the lumbar region of the back, you can see that we're, we're animating going deeper and deeper and deeper to the spine. And you can see as we go deeper that the 
volume and magnitude of muscle tissue becomes significantly less. So with back injuries, very oftentimes it's those small muscles that uh, are strained, and it's those ligaments, et cetera, that might uh, be torn that might ultimately lead, or the, the disc injured that might ultimately lead to injury to the spinal cord. So um, unfortunately, the, the low back region does not have terribly strong musculature, and the low back is a frequent site of injury for athletes. It's a particular concern with wheelchair athletes that the shoulder is very oftentimes effective, and particularly the uh, rotator cuff muscle group. So here we're seeing the, the the surface view with the deltoid muscle. When we cut that away, we can see the deltoid. Or we can see the rotator cuff muscles uh, on the posterior aspect of the scapula. Those smaller muscles are not able to generate sufficient force uh, when when frequently um, forcefully contracted and can break down. And part of what happens is, of course, that when the arm is rotated through more extreme range of motion, uh, soft tissues such as muscle tendon and ligaments, et cetera, can rub up against uh, harder tissues like bony tissue, and the frictional forces uh, resulting from those repetitions uh, can lead to uh, wear and fraying and, the, and an eventual breakdown. And here's a side view, a lateral view of the body. You can see that the shoulder joint itself is not a very deep cavity, particularly compared to the hip joint. And while that is good in the sense that it gives us a large range of motion, it is bad in the sense that we don't have nearly as much stability, and therefore the chances for shoulder injuries are significantly increased compared to hip injuries. And then, of course, uh, again, with wheelchair athletes, uh, hand and wrist injuries because of the repetition of force applied uh, through those uh, areas to the, the, the wheels of the chair or explain carpal tunnel syndrome and various problems of that nature can be seen when you look at all the tissues all the tendons that pass through the wrist into the hand. Uh, it's a very confined space, and any sort of swelling that occurs in that area can cause significant problems. So uh, chair users have some, some significant issues that uh, isn't necessarily associated with other athletes. Dr. Johnson, yes. we're having a little technical problem. The animation is not shown. Now, now, we have the, now we have the stress and strain on tissues, but the previous one wasn't showing up. Uh, did you, were you able to see anything at all? No, it was, uh, no we, there wasn't any diagram showing at all. So. Well, I, I apologize for that. It looked really cool on my computer. Um, but I, I think you understand what I'm talking about. Um, you can sort of see uh, in this particular diagram what I was alluding to at the initial part of that previous discussion. The muscles that you're looking at along the spine here are very small in size. Therefore, each individual muscle is not very strong. Collectively, they are quite strong, but individually not so strong. So when, when stress is placed on a particular area, then you can understand why a muscle might be strained in your low back and it might hurt like the Dickens for quite a long time. So the, the size of muscles and the, the, the fitness level of a muscle is certainly a, a, a strong consideration. And so that would be true in the low back, the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, whatever the case may be. Ultimately, it comes down to how stress and strain are applied to tissues. And stress, of course, is associated with the load or the force applied. And the kinds of loads that are typically applied to these tissues are tension forces that are forces that pull apart, compression forces that are forces that work uh, in the same direction as each other. Shearing forces occur uh, at 90 degrees uh, to the tissue. Bending forces cause the, the tissue to bend. So if you think about a bone that would have curvature to it, it very well could be because of a bending type of force. And then, of course, torsional forces are twisting sorts of forces. Any one of these forces together or, or individually can lead to injury. But typically when injuries occur, it's when you're getting multiples of these things happening at one time. Our body is well designed uh, from a bony perspective to deal with compression forces. Our muscles and tendons are well designed to deal with tension forces. But bones are not very well designed to deal with compression, bending, and torsion at the same time. So when the forces are coming from multiple directions, the chance for injury is significantly increased. So when you think about that javelin thrower that we saw earlier, uh, torquing the shoulder to throw the javelin, Forces are coming from all sorts of different directions onto the, the shoulder joint. And so the, the tissues in and around the shoulder, particularly the humerus bone or the bone of the upper arm, 
are experiencing high forces and in a, in a variety of different directions. And of course then the rotator cuff muscles are trying to control a lot of that energy that's being generated. So you can understand how with repetitive throwing or with repetitive propulsion of the wheelchair that it's possible for uh, those muscle groups or those tendons to, to eventually give out and uh, to, to rupture. The amount of load applied then leads to the deformation. So all of these tissues, whether they're soft tissues or, or hard tissues like bone, can change in shape and length. So when the tensile forces, the compression, the shear, the bending, and the torsional loads are applied to these tissues, they do change in shape. They might get longer, they might twist, and those are the things that can then lead to injury. So if we exceed what we call the elastic limits of the bones, tendons, ligaments, and cartilage, then our chances for injury are significantly greater. And if we apply very large forces, uh, it might very well be that we reach the failure point. The failure point, when the failure point is reached, typically that is an acute injury, an injury that, that occurs on the moment. So the fractured leg, the, the, the sprained ankle, the torn ACL. Back injuries, rotator cuff injuries are typically overuse injuries which means that we're bumping up against the elastic limits of the tissues repetitively and eventually those tissues give way. This graph shows that. On the vertical axis is the force or load and on the horizontal axis is the length and deformation. So if you come over here to the origin and follow the red line, oops, sorry, you can see that in this little box following that red line, this is the elastic region. That means that when the tissue is loaded and deforms, it's able to return back to its resting length with no problem. We call that the normal range for most people. So most of us in our activities of daily living and even in sport stay within this range. But if we're the elite athlete that's continually pushing ourselves out along that curve and we're starting to approach this blue arrow right here, that would indicate that perhaps little micro fractures or micro tears are starting to occur. Uh, we may not feel it, we may not even know it's occurring, but the tissue is beginning to break down. So if we continue to push ourselves into this limit, eventually we're going to get an overuse injury. If we keep pushing it such that overuse injury becomes worse, or we get ourselves into a very high force, very deformed tissue situation that occurs with an acute injury, we hit this plastic region. So all of a sudden, when we break from this straight line into this jagged line, we've now gone to the point where the tissue is now no longer able to go back to its resting length. So failure starts to occur, and if the force continues to be applied, complete failure occurs. So we get not as much deformation of the tissue because now it's been ruptured, and you can see that the load, even though we might continue to try to produce the load, uh, falls precipitously. So we run and we have no problems, all of a sudden a big force gets applied, the bone starts to fracture, we continue to apply the, the load and boom, all of a sudden we've got a compound fracture occurring. Or an ACL injury or a spinal cord injury or whatever the case may be. So this graph really tells the story very effectively as to why injuries occur. We want to try to keep people in this range as much as possible. But we know that through effective and sound training that we can bump this curve up a little bit higher so that people are able to withstand greater forces and even with greater forces being applied to bones, ligaments, tendons, etc., the amount of deformation that's going to occur as a result of an increased force is not as great. So just imagine taking this graph and moving it up here. That's to the positive for the, for the highly trained athlete. But that doesn't mean that, that 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 highly trained athlete can't become injured. So the effects of loading are, in terms of deformation of tissues, when external force is applied to the body, several factors will influence whether an injury occurs. How much the force is, is that's being applied in the direction of that force, the area over which the force is distributed, so the pressure question, the issues, of course, of that load deformation curve, whether we're approaching the yield point or the elastic limits, and then, of course, the failure point. So the issues of repetitive versus acute loading. You know, repetitive loading are activities like wheelchair propulsion, running, and things of that nature. The single repetition of a push of the chair or of, of, of a stride in running 
will not lead to injury. But if you do it too frequently and at high enough force, eventually it can cause an injury. Acute loading might be in a situation such as that depicted here in the picture with a wheelchair crash because then the magnitude of forces can become quite high. The momentum might be high given how the, the collision occurs. Of course, the frictional forces associated with, uh, with the, the surface of the skin onto the track, et cetera, et cetera. So we would consider things like a tendon or a ligament rupture to be more of a macro trauma event and things like a minor, minor tendon strain or a stress fracture, a micro trauma event. So we certainly, through good sound training, can minimize the possibility for repetitive loading by training wisely and using the best equipment possible. And we can do our level best to try to control acute loading, but sometimes things occur that we just have no control over. So some of the overuse or chronic injuries that, are, that occur in sport that we call repetitive motion injuries or things like bursitis or inflammation of the bursa, tendonitis, inflammation of tendons, plantar fasciitis, uh, patellofemoral syndrome, sprains and strains of ligaments and muscles, stress fractures, and lower back injuries. Again, things that with proper technique, uh, proper equipment, proper training perhaps we can, can minimize. Acute injuries are more severe sprains and tears that occur. Uh, in the course of performance, uh, to ligaments, strains or tears that occur with, to muscles and tendons, dislocations of joints, and of course fractures. Again, those are situations where perhaps forces are high or body tissues are forced to move in directions that they weren't designed to move in. Again, I go back to the issue of momentum and impulse. It's because very often times athletes are moving at high velocities and are both speeding up and slowing down. So applying positive impulses to speed up and negative impulses to slow down, that injuries oftentimes occur. And trying to propel the wheelchair to high velocity, certainly the individual needs to be able to create the kinds of linear and rotational momenta necessary. Uh, and in order to accelerate the chair, the individual has to be cognizant, too, of applying force to the wheels, but doing so where the area is distributed. So without the use of some sort of unique uh, glove or device to reduce frictional forces to the skin, then the athlete might uh, be more subject to the potential for injury. But they might also find that by utilize, utilizing some unique equipment, they can also increase their performance by taking advantage of friction. So athletes find unique ways to distribute forces over greater areas. Keep in mind that in any sort of physical activity where force is applied to the body and ultimately to the skeletal system, that bones will grow as a result of those force applications. So thus, the individual that trains regularly, like the high-performance athlete, is going to see bone hypertrophy or bone growth to those parts of the body where forces are regularly and routinely applied. So because of that habitual loading, the bones will respond favorably, just as will the muscles but keep in, keeping in mind that it is possible to overdo. Likewise, when physical activity diminishes, someone is in a bedridden situation, someone is sedentary, someone just simply does not get up and move so that forces are minimized to the body, the bones will atrophy. And we know the same thing will happen to muscles. So decrease in size and density and therefore will lose their ability to create force. Obviously, one of the issues that we're most concerned with in terms of injury is injury to joints. Joint stability is critical. Uh, clearly, muscular strength can help to control joints, but also the, the, uh, the size and shape of bones around joints comes into play. But ultimately, acute types of injuries oftentimes occur when forces happen from outside the body that try to move the joints in directions that joints weren't designed to move in. So when that happens, very oftentimes we hear about that sprain to a ligament or that tearing of a ligament. And that's, again, an indication that bones are, 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 are being rotated in such a way that the soft tissues that try to control those bones uh, become excessively strained and deformed. Um, articular cartilage that you find in many joints is there to reduce friction. Uh, meniscal cartilage is there to provide a good base of support and to reduce friction as well. The width of the, uh, of the bone of the lower leg provides some stability for the knee joint in the frontal perspective, but uh, from the side perspective, uh, there's less stability, but that's because we have to flex and extend our knees. We don't want to abduct and adduct our knees. So we have ligaments that try to control the, the motions of the lower leg on the upper leg in the undesirable directions. 
and understanding that ligaments by themselves are not able to generate force. They only respond. And so when the knee gets a force that comes in from the outside, such that it causes the knee to bend inward, then the ligament on the inside of the knee will be stretched. So if that force is of sufficient magnitude that it exceeds the limits of the tissue strength, that ligament will tear. One of the things that we're pretty cognizant of in terms of reducing the chances for injury in athletes is maintaining good flexibility. Obviously what we're trying to do is to train the muscles and the tendons to relax so that um, there is a good range of motion. So clearly part of any good program for injury prevention will be flexibility training. Uh, and again, we're trying to stress there the strength or the lengthening rather of the muscles and uh, through their tendons. Uh, if someone is very inflexible, their chances for injury are significantly increased. And so we know at different times in one's lifespan that we have less uh, flexibility uh, perhaps uh, in, in, uh, in adolescence and that might influence the kinds of injuries that the adolescent athlete might have in older individuals where there's less collagen tissue there's a greater chance for injury because the tissues are less pliable so obviously trying to maintain flexibility is very very uh, important so some, in some injury prevention strategies I know our time is about up here is individualization of training. Make sure that the training program that you give to your athletes fits that particular athlete's needs. Make sure that they pay attention to the warning signs of an impending injury. If they feel pain or discomfort, pay attention to that because that's a sign that an injury may be coming. Ensure that they're practicing a good warm-up, stretching, and a cool-down period. Make sure their equipment is appropriate and proper and make sure that their training prescription is appropriate. The mode of the exercise they're doing is appropriate. The duration or length is appropriate. The frequency, how often they exercise or perform, the intensity of that performance, and the progression, particularly when you're thinking about a preseason to an in season to a postseason situation. So for prevention of injuries, conditioning is critical. Make sure that the conditioning of the athlete is specific to the sport, that the progression is gradual, the flexibility is taken into consideration both statically and dynamically. If they're a real dynamic athlete in the sense that they perform uh, high-intensity power athletic uh, movements, then you need to pay particular attention to both the, the static, the, the, the stationary sort of flexibility uh, from a training perspective, but also that high dynamic flexibility. And then, of course, the strength and muscular development. Make sure they have good general muscular strength before you try to get too specific with their muscular training. So a base of strength is critical before you try to do things that are much more advanced. Never play, uh, underplay the, the importance of rest and recovery. Rest and recovery is just as important to good performance as is conditioning. And if the athlete doesn't rest, it's a perfect formula for creating injury. Keep in mind that fatigue is the enemy of the athlete. And while from an, from an endurance perspective we have to push athletes to the point of fatigue, just keep in mind that when athletes routinely perform their sports activities or training activities when in a fatigue state, their chance of injury significantly increases because the muscles that deal with the forces applied to the body aren't able to act as effectively as shock absorbers. So what are the takeaways? Use basic common sense and logical thinking to prevent or reduce injuries. Think about some of these concepts that we've talked about today. Remember that force leads to motion that leads to energy that leads to injury. Force is the enemy that we have to be constantly cognizant of. The body's tissues have physiological biomechanical limitations that if exceeded will lead to injury, so try to stay within those as much as you possibly can. One must limit or reduce force applied to and by the body while also avoiding extreme deformation of body tissues in unnatural positions. And then lastly, chronic fatigue and overtraining is the enemy of the athlete with or without a disability. I apologize for having rushed.